Welcome to the Leadonomics Show. Today we're going to have a chat with Tantri Dr. Jamila Mahmood, whom we fondly know as Dr. Jim. Dr. Jim began her career as a gynecologist and later turned into a humanitarian, founding this organization called Mercy Malaysia. Join me now in my discussion with Dr. Jim. Dr. Jim, welcome to the show. Great yeah. to have you here with us on the Leroy Show. Thank you know, you. tell us, you know, this, this show is really about leadership. Tell us how you became a leader. Well, I think uh, everyone, every time people ask me this question, I kind of have to pause a little bit because when you dis describe when, yeah. and decide that you're a leader, I right. guess you, you, only, you only are a leader when you actually have followers. Mm -hmm. so, so when did um, you get followers? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, from a very young age, I've always had people sort of working with me and um, me kind of, if you like, leading a team, mm -hmm. whether it was in a society or a club. Um, but um, I think in the humanitarian sector, certainly, you know, being the founder of an organization like Mercy Malaysia kind of puts me in a leadership role. Mm. Um, and because there were people who actually believed in the cause and followed it, you know, automatically, I guess that's the leader leadership role that mm. I played. Yeah. But were there any defining moments in your life that that enabled your leadership to come out to light? You know, uh, that or yeah. any, in fact helped define who you are. I think it was from very young. Uh, I come from a a very strange, diverse kind of family. Um, I lost my father very young when I was eleven, and my mother, for some reason, even though I was the youngest child had always entrusted me with, uh, with some money uh, that I would take down to Singapore uh, to visit some of you know, our relatives who were there. And she would make, make me uh, go down and make sure that you know, the children had school books and shoes and whatever. Uh, so I think you know, from a very young age then, she had already started grooming me in a leadership role, right. which uh, at that point, of course, I thought being a rebel well, she can't stand me. She's just getting rid of me in the yeah. school holidays, you know. But, but, but you, I'm sure you learn independence. Yeah, and yeah. A whole it bunch was. Of other things, right? Yeah, it was very strange, you know. At 13 years old, uh, you know, going down south on your own. Um, those days you don't have and, mobile phones. And really phone. on your own, right? I mean, Literally there's nobody. On my right? own, yeah. Put yourself in the train and you're down there. Yeah, yeah. And someone picked me up on the other side, and then, uh, you know, staying there for a couple of weeks, making sure everything was okay, and then coming back. And and you know, and you mentioned before to me. I mean, some other conversation about. Uh, important moment in 1969 where mm. you you started your your first you know your first lesson of <laughs> yes, giving I think yes. or, or at least exposing yourself to danger yeah. to give. Yeah. Well, 1969 uh, May 13th, as you know, uh, we lived in Pataling Jaya, and at that time there was curfew. My father was still alive then, a very respected member of the community, and he would have you know the the chicken seller and the you know vegetable seller, whatever, yeah. the rice seller, sending us food to the house. And those days, you know, we live in, you have these large monsoon drains. Yeah. Um, and we knew there were people around that were, you know, bachelors that didn't have stock of food like a family does. So my father would make us sort of carry little bags of food and rice and stuff. And because we were small, we would actually go in the monsoon drains and walk to the different houses and sort of become distributors of food and you know he would slaughter chickens and we would you know bring this the chickens. And this is a white detection during the, the Yeah, the, the, even the though to be honest I didn't really feel unsafe. It okay. was more very quiet, nobody on the street kind of thing but you know I used to do that, yeah. And, and how, how did those experiences, I mean the, the fact that your family and I think your father and mother were also very giving people. Yeah. How, how did that translate itself into your your, your founding of Mercy, I mean, uh, yeah. because so you, you were a gynecologist before, right? How, how, yeah. did that, how did that transition happen from there to yeah. Mercy? Well, we lived in a house that had, in the evenings, 10, 20 people in the hallway. Uh, they would come from all sorts of places. Uh, you know, my father and mother would always have a home for people and food on the table. Uh, so, I think it was 90, you know, all my life I've always wanted to you know, become a doctor and also be a doctor that would actually do good. Yeah. But you know how it's like in Malaysia, you, you get onto this treadmill of a rat race that when you finish your medical degree, you go on to do a postgraduate degree, you go on to a postgraduate degree, I was an academic for a while and then got tired of that, went to private practice, got very tired of that because, you know, uh, 
not just tired, I got very disillusioned, to mm. be honest. Um, and then, you know, said, why am I not following my heart that I really wanted to be a doctor for everyone? And, you know, at that point, I decided that one way would be to be uh, of service in, in crisis. And it's always something I wanted to do, but no opportunity when you mm. were in the government service. So I think being in the private practice was, was a huge blessing. You know, you have some savings and then you can just start this. But of course, I realized very soon that it was a full-time job. I couldn't just be a doctor and then be a part-time humanitarian. I think the tsunami was a tipping yeah. point where I had to decide. Um, so I think it's always been in me. It's just that you never really know when to take the dive, mm. uh, you know, and take the risk that this is a huge career change. And you, and you ran Mercy for quite a long time, right? almost a decade, right? So Ten years, yeah. Ten years, right? I mean, what were some of the, the lessons or the, the hard truths that you learned running Mercy? I mean, it must not have been that easy, right? No. I mean, you make it, I know every time I talk to you, you, you make it sound like, oh, it's a, such an easy thing, but I, I, I'm sure there are some great lessons that you yeah. learned from running it, right? Well, first of all, I don't think it was um, that hard. Mm -hmm. I think it wasn't easy, but it wasn't impossible. Okay. Uh, you must remember I come from a background of being a medical professional. So I have no training in management, in finance. And when you run an organization, you need to have all that. Yes. But the good thing is that I was willing to ask for help. Okay. And I always you know, readily ask for help. My family came to me, uh, friends you know, who were really very you know, smart people mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. were in the corporate sector and you know, who would just always be there for me. And I think the biggest you know, uh, decision I made then was if Mercy Malaysia was going to, to outlive me, it needed to have very solid foundations mm. and a good organization structure. And therefore, I reached out to you know, the private sector to support me in actually doing an organizational audit and actually setting the framework for how you know, Mercy Malaysia is going to outlive me. And, right. and I think that's been the, probably the, one of the best things I ever did was actually uh, say to donors, don't give me money yet. Just make me a strong organization and then give me money. Okay. So, oh, so that was the foundational Yeah, block yeah. That you set I mean, we started as really a, a voluntary organization. Right. When we started Mercy Malaysia, everyone paid for their own airfare. We would go to, you know, to war zones or to disasters paying for our own airfare and mm. not earning a single cent. Um, and, you know, the organization would just make sure you had food, you know, and, yep. and some sec security and transport, logistics, whatever. Um, but uh, you know, later on we realized that we had to be a bit more professional as mm. an outfit because we were growing, and then you know developing the systems that followed. Yeah. Mm. So you know, we started because I you know this for me at the time I said this is my gift for Malaysia. This is my legacy. Mm. I want to build an organization that provides a platform for everyone, irrespective of race, religion, right. color, to come together to do good for others who are also irrespective of race, religion, culture, right. boundary, whatever. And I'm very, um, you know, I'm very, very adamant that development is not about infrastructure alone, it's not about economics, it's not about a better GDP, it's about, you know, human capital development, it's mm. about global compassion, it's about, you know, a world now that is so globalized and so interlinked and we need to plug into that and be at least, you know, conscious mm. that whatever happens in country A does affect country B and, you know, you become a developed nation when you're able to give. Mm. So, so I guess you know I saw development from that, that perspective. Angle, yeah. yeah. Okay. You, know, you know what? I mean, you talked a little bit about setting up the foundation, but mm. I think one of the hardest things to do, at least I, I feel, is to let go of an organization when yeah. you've you've reached a point where you've rested enough and yeah. it's time for somebody else to take the reins. Yeah. How how did you let go of mercy? I mean, how did yeah. you? Uh, how I, I, tell us a bit about the struggle sure. and also a little bit in terms of why it was the right thing and, yeah. and how, how you went through the process of moving on and handing the mantle over. Sure. Well, the letting go was not difficult because it was never about me. Okay. It's always been about setting a platform for the so, nation. And you set that up up front inside, inside, inside you. Inside me as well. Because Mercy grew successful yeah. and it's easy to absorb that success yeah. as part of yourself. Yeah, it? but it's never been about okay. me. Okay. Uh, I think the biggest wake-up call for me about uh, succession was uh, after Iraq, mm. you know, and as you know, I got shot in Iraq and, you know, there was a near-death experience. Mm. Then I brought the whole team together and I pu put it on the wall in the life after gym. And I said, what happens if I died then? Yeah. Would the organization just collapse or would it continue? So we need to think now about life after me. Mm. And I think that was 2005 and 2004. Uh, so I said, well, then 10 years, 2009, I will step down. So I gave myself a 
myself as well, the horizon, you know, wow. a kind of like a goal that that would be the time I would leave. It's very easy to say that because when the time actually comes, you you kind of question. But let's go back to the the, the challenges and the and the opportunities. First of all, nothing is a challenge, right? Mm. I mean, you have to look at everything half empty, half full. Mm. For me, in 1999, setting it up when I started, you know, I saw the war in Kosovo. I was very affected by it. My mm. son was five years old. He looked at me and says, "Mom, you're a doctor. Don't complain. Go and help these people." <laughs> so, you know, and then I had, a, of course, a very supportive husband who who said, "You know, this has been something you want to do all your mm. life. Go mm. chase your mm. dream." Then I started to write to organisations inside Malaysia, and nobody responded to me. Mm the so-called, you know, close to humanitarian organizations. And then maybe I thought, well, maybe maybe the thing is crazy, this woman wants to go to a war zone, right? So I thought, okay, never mind. So I actually applied to join Doctors Without Borders. And then, you know, at that point, my husband kind of said, if you join them, you'll just be one Malaysian doctor in a French organization. Why can't you build an organization for Malaysian people? You're good at that. So I'm like, okay. So we took all our savings out uh, at that point and said, okay, he says, this is our investment for the, for the organization. Right. If we fail, we haven't hurt anyone. It's our savings. Um, I guess the rest is history. When I started to tell people, People at first thought it was curious, it was a new thing. Yeah. So we had then, if you like, you know, you look at Six Sigma thing, we were like, no yeah. competition, lah, you know, we were, we were something new, right? Uh, but then again, you, you, and then, you know, being an obstetrician gyne gynecologist in private practice, you have a very strong client base who loves you and who wants to help you, so thinking you that you're just going for one, tr right. two trips, right? right. <clears throat> so the money came okay. from people. I mean, majority of the funding for Mercy Malaysia during my tenure was from the public, mm. Malaysian public. Yep. Uh, and, and then, you know, uh, as it grew, of course, you know, it grew also in, in opportunities mm. because here was a very unique organization mm. that was not Western, that had people in it that had all sorts of colors, you know, would, would be from very different religious backgrounds. Yeah. And yet when they go on mission, they kind of click yeah. And you know, everyone, you know, it's like when you travel overseas, wherever race you are, you start speaking Malay, right? Because mm. nobody can understand you, kind of like secret code between us. And then people actually be wondering, oh, yeah, you know, although my, my volunteers were Malay, Chinese, Indian, everybody's talking Malay, we were all eating United, sambal to, together, you know, that. So it was a real unity. Yeah. And for me, that was my biggest joy, yeah. you know, seeing people coming together to do good. To good yeah. So then you have yeah, the skeptics. Mm. There will always be skeptics. Right? Skeptics can be pretty mean. Huh? How, how do you overcome the skeptics? I mean, because I, mm. I think that's part of leadership that yeah. is very important because you still go, you, you still focus towards the end goal yeah. in spite of the fact that you have all these things beating on you, right? It's hard. Uh, I think, you know, I'm uh, by nature very sensitive. You tell us about one of the skeptics yeah. or tell us about one issue and, and how you dealt with that. I had real issues initially. Uh, well, so many issues. Let me see which one is... Uh, <laughs> That's controversial. Um, okay, first of all, you had the people saying, you know, she's a woman. Yeah. How can she do this? That, that's, you know? all, that's bound to come up. Yeah, right? you know, she doesn't care about her family, what lousy mother she is, what lousy wife she is, you know, all this kind of stuff. Mm. And then, you know, that was easy because I had a husband and family who would just say to me, no, yeah. we are very proud of you. You know, we want you to do this. Forget about that. So that's not so difficult. Uh, you know, of course, they make up stories about, you know, oh, she's unhappy in marriage, actually they're divorced, you know, she, he has a second wife, all these things, like, you know, the one I can, I can deal with. Then there's the other group that, that looks at you and says... So you just don't care, right? You just I do on. care, but, you know, but, I have the support system that, yeah. that, that is that, so that loving, helps you, that helps, you that helps me okay. to, to, to get over this. But the second thing, of course, with the politics, right? Then people kind of say, oh, this one must be... Uh, you know, because I'm so independent and all that, must be opposition, you know, mm. must be anti-government. So, like, you know, where does this come from? Yeah. You know, just because you're not aligned politically to any party Doesn't and you mean. want to be neutral because the whole basis of humanitarianism is impartiality, independence, Absolutely. neutrality, then you have to deal with both sides accusing you of all sorts of things. You know, an opposition tells you, says you're a crony, you know, the ruling party says you're opposition. So, you know, I was like this... Hang on a minute, what am I, you know, but that one also I had to deal with, but, you know, some people were just outright mean mm. to you. They just try to block you all the time. But, you know, I always say at the end of the day, you know, my conviction is that this is something I do fully, yeah. sincerely. Yeah. If it fails, 
I'll fail beautifully. Yeah. If it if it succeeds, you know, I'll succeed. Right. But it's and not me alone. It's a whole team. Right. And, yeah. and to some extent, today you are justified. I mean, with the yeah. awards you're winning and yeah. the fact that you and uh, you had an assignment in UN and now yeah. you're probably going back to the yeah. UN in a yeah. couple of weeks, right? Yeah. Um, tell, tell us. I mean, very briefly, maybe. Um, you know, in, in UN, right? What's your goal uh, in terms of what you hope to achieve, you know, as, you know in your yeah. second stint now in the UN? Yeah. What do you hope to achieve in, in this second stint? You know, the United Nations is a, it's a very funny animal. Uh, it's, 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 it's a, you're an international civil servant, mm. okay? That's mm. the UN. Okay. And it's like a huge ship. So you can't turn the ship very quickly. But you know what? It's the one agency that has a whole opportunity to look at global policy. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, the first two years was looking at women's health, reproductive health, gender issues in emergencies. So I did that for two years, put in some standard operating procedures and policies and all that. I moved on, came back, to, took a break. Uh, my next thing will also be doing something quite unique. Um, also in the women's space? <clears throat> no, no, it's okay. in the humanitarian sector. Okay. So again, you know, I will never take a long tenure. I'll do it for two years, three years max, and then, you know, take a break again. Because I'm not interested in being a long-term UN career mm. diplomat, but I want to go in to do things that can change right. how things are done in future. Fantastic. So I think uh, for me, it's about how do you influence policy and see that turn into some kind of action and then leave and do something right. else. Yeah. Final question. You know, what advice would you give young people out there who look to you and are inspired and say, mm. I want to be a woman of, you know, just like Dr. Jim, you know, mm. I, I want to be successful. Um, what, what, what piece of advice would you give someone just coming out of school? Yeah. And I, I will say to them, number one, they can be far better than me. And the second thing is, you must always be very sincere in what you do. And you must be convinced and you must be passionate. I think the day you wake up uh, from and you want to go to work and there's no fire in you, mm. you better think about stopping work and changing it to something else. I think nothing is impossible. Chase your dreams. But chasing, you know, vision without planning yeah. uh, is really you know hallucination, yeah? It's, it's, it's not worth... You have to realise that the pieces have to fit and for the pieces to fit, you have to really take time to understand the environment. And it's very, very important to network. It's very important to build many, many friends and alliances around you. You will always have enemies, but you we can only hope that for every, you know, 10 friends you have, maybe you have one enemy. It's okay. You know, you have to realize that at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's about the cause. It's about what you're doing it for. And... Um, and, and one of the biggest advice I will say that I have always stuck to is make sure you surround yourself with people who will tell you what you're not doing right. Mm. It's very easy to be a leader and to be very happy and contented that everyone's saying, oh, what a great leader you, ha you are. But that will probably be the downfall of a leader when, it does, when he or she doesn't have people to say, you know, what you did, that's not quite the right thing to do. I would really, you know, like to give you some advice and feedback. So I think you have to surround yourself with people like this. And, and the last thing is, you will be hurt along the way. You will have, you will trust people who turn out to be people you can't trust. Um, you will make mistakes, but I always say that mistakes, you know, an error doesn't become a mistake that is repeated twice, says Martin Luther King, right? Uh, every, every error you make must be taken as a learning opportunity. Be humble, be brave and courageous enough to say, I'm sorry, I did the wrong thing or I made a mistake. I think a lot of leaders think that it's, it, they're infallible, mm. that they can't make mistakes. And I think that's a huge problem. Thank you, Dr. Jim. We really appreciate having you here on yeah, the Leader Omics Show. Welcome. And we wish you all the best in your stint in the UN for Thank a second you. time. We're here with uh, Dr. Jim on the Leader Omics Show. Mm.